and it is now seven o'clock. And so it's time to get started with 60 Minutes in Space. So I'd like to introduce Curator of Space Sciences, Dr. Kachun Yu. Take it away, Kachun. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mitch, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I've been gone from 60 Minutes for a couple months. So um, as Mitch says, I hope to catch up on some of the news um, from uh, that I think um, some people are, have been really burning uh, to hear about, but um, I'm going to start um, kind of um, far away at first, and then I'm going to move um, closer to home. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, my first story is about the um, Galactic Center. And so you can see this title, Meerkat Looks at the Galactic Center. And, um, and for those of you who uh, read the New York Times, this is actually um, something that showed up in the New York Times, this image. Uh, back um, right at the end of January, and uh, and so it, it made a lot of press. And and um, what this is, it's a radio um, interferometry um, image um, of the Galactic Center, and Meerkat is actually a set of radio um, telescope dishes down in South Africa. So um, South Africa um, actually has um, quite a number of um, a handful of observatories. Uh, the government supports astronomy uh, quite heavily. And so um, they're um, partners in a, a project to um, install a um, multi-continent um, wide um, set of radio dishes and Meerkat is kind of a precursor to that. Uh, but currently Meerkat consists of 64 um, radio dishes, each uh, about um, 13 um, meters in diameter. So you know, that's on the order of uh, 50 feet or so. And when you have multiple um, radio dishes, um, what you can do is you can combine the um, information from um, those radio dishes to get um, much um, higher resolution um, imagery, um, at least in, um, in um, those particular radio waves that um, your instruments are sensitive to. And so here is that image again, but uh, instead of from the press release, this is actually from the paper um, that was released. Um, and, um, and so this is um, a, uh, a region um, centered uh, towards the galactic center. So this very center of our galaxy, it's at a wavelength of about um, 23 um, centimeters. So um, on the order of um, eight inches um, or so, uh, meaning that that's how long um, each of the wavelengths um, are for the radio waves that are being detected. And, um, and the galactic plane um, actually runs um, sort of diagonal. And so um, you, you can imagine it running um, from, from kind of the upper left to the um, lower right. And you see a lot of different um, uh, nebu um, filamentary um, structures and um, bubble-like um, structures, um, round shapes. Um, of course, the edges of the, um, the image are round too. <laughs> But ignore the edges. I'm just talking about the um, the, the dark um, and, and uh, regions. And the colors are somewhat confusing. Um, so you might notice that there's a black and white color scheme, and there's also kind of a red, orange, and yellow um, color scheme as well. And so what's going on is that they decided to use two different color schemes because they wanted to show um, a really wide or um, a large dynamic range. So if you look in the upper right corner, you can see. A, uh, there's a color bar that's black and white. Um, and then there's also another color bar that goes from kind of a deep um, dark red or dark brown to, um, to yellow um, and, and then white. And, um, and, and those um, color bars um, basically represent the intensity of the radio um, information or the radio waves that are emanating from the galactic center. And so um, in order to show um, both faint detail, meaning detail that it's coming from uh, sources that aren't, aren't very bright, not very luminous. Um, they're showing that in the, um, the black and white, uh, the kind of the grayscale color bar. And so the outer parts, the perimeter of the image is in that grayscale, uh, black and white. But as you go to the parts of the image that have very bright sources, especially right towards um, the center of the galaxy, um, th then they switch to that other color scale, um, the one that goes from brown to yellow to white. So, um, so that's why there are two different sets of colors. Um, and the, uh, the galactic center is that um, very bright orangish um, blob, uh, very close to the center of this ring. And that is where um, the central supermassive black hole of our galaxy is. 
And so um, our um, Milky Way galaxy has a 4 million mass, solar mass black hole, meaning that's 4 million times the mass of our sun, and it resides at the center of our galaxy. But as you can see, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on there as well. And so let's uh, zoom in. Now, remember, the, uh, these are radio waves. And so what we're seeing is uh, mostly emission coming from um, very hot gases towards the galactic center. Um, we're not seeing any stars at all, uh, but the galactic center is populated by um, many hundreds of millions of, of stars. And so if you were to um, look at this um, in um, other wavelengths, you might be able to see um, those stars but because we're looking at very long um, radio wavelengths, you don't see any stars at all. And so again, um, the, uh, the central supermassive black hole is in that bright, bright blob at um, kind of the lower part of the screen. But you can also see lots of other filamentary uh, features. And people have been studying uh, these features for many decades. And there's still um, some uncertainty as to um, the origins of these filaments, except we know that you know, they, they might be related to magnetic fields that are um, threaded throughout the central um, core of our galaxy. Um, and then uh, we also see lots of other um, sort of more circular um, shells, so as opposed to the um, kind of straight up and down uh, filaments. And those could be shells of gas that have been um, expanded outwards by exploding supernova. And then uh, in our next image, I'm going to zoom in to the uh, bright core um, that surrounds uh, the supermassive black hole. And so now we're looking just at that and we're neglecting um, some of the other filamentary uh, features. Um, but again, uh, the black hole is um, towards the, um, there's an inner knot that's brightest and it's um, right towards the center of that. Now, what's really interesting is that um, we know that um, our uh, black hole uh, at the galactic center is not very active. And by what I mean by activity is that, you know, uh, we also often think of uh, black holes as being vacuum, vacuum cleaners in space. And that's actually not a very good description because things can, um, can actually orbit black holes. They, um, they are just a, um, uh, an object with a lot of gravity because they, they're extremely massive. And so objects don't necessarily fall in unless they lose energy or, uh, and they fall in or if um, the trajectory takes them right towards the black hole. And so things can um, stay in orbit. But what um, does happen is that um, gas um, stars can fall into the black hole. And when they do, um, some of that material gets jammed up in an accretion disk and it, uh, ends up emitting a lot of um, energy um, when, that, um, when that gas heats up. And so in other galaxies, we see the central massive black holes emitting jets and emitting lots of radiation. But our um, supermassive black hole is uh, pretty quiet. It's, um, it's not very active at all compared to, to other galaxies. But what's interesting is that if we look and, um, and people have done this in, um, in either the, uh, the wavelengths that um, are being used uh, for this study or in other wavelengths. Um, and this is actually um, by the same authors, uh, but from a paper from um, almost three years ago from 2019. And uh, they're again using uh, the Meerkat um, telescope array and they're looking at the galactic center. And so you, um, that kind of dark blob at the center of the uh, picture on the left is, uh, is where the supermassive black hole is. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, and then, but um, what they also notice is this immense bubble that you can see that stretches out above the galactic plane. So this is the galactic plane. And then um, you have this blob that blows out towards the north and towards the galactic um, south. And these giant bubbles are um, about um, 1400 light years by about 460 light years um, across. So these are enormous structures. And, um, and it's estimated that based on um, estimates of how fast the gas is expanding, whatever outburst uh, pushed the gas out to create these bubbles probably occurred over the last couple million years. But the fact that you can see an edge to the bubble um, at the bottom and the top ends shows you that these outbursts don't continue continuously. Um, they seem to occur for a short period of time and then they stop. And currently, um, we don't see very much activity from that central massive black hole. So, um, but this um, does show you evidence that in the past, um, the black hole has been more active, or um, you know, or other things um, near the black hole have been active. 
Um, but the amount of energy that it takes to pump up this bubble is on the order of 100 supernovae or, or more. So that's a, a lot of energy. Um, you'd expect lots of supernova to go off to create um, an explosions mass of enough to, to blow out these bubbles. Um, or uh, more likely, it's um, um, interactions of in falling gas um, in an accretion disk um, near the black hole that causes that has caused these bubbles to blow out. So let's go back to uh, the the more recent image. And here I've um, twisted, um, turned the image around, rotated it so uh, the galactic plane runs uh, horizontally. And you can see um, in when we zoom in. Um, They've labeled um, a number of the structures. So the, the black hole is in um, a structure called the um, Sagittarius A uh, complex. And Sagittarius, um, you see Sagittarius, or at least the abbreviation for Sagittarius, quite a bit, SGR. And that's just because uh, our galactic center is towards uh, the constellation of Sagittarius. So there are many features here that are named, um, well, simply just Sagittarius A, B, C, D, E. And uh, then the, um, the call, by this, um, just based on the radio features that were, um, that were first discovered when astronomers first pointed um, their radio telescopes to the galactic center. So SAG A is the uh, brightest source um, discovered in the galactic center, and then SAG B was um, discovered next, and so forth. But you can also see lots of other um, interesting um, objects that, um, that people have known about for quite a bit. So there's something known as the NAUS that's down here. And then there's also something known as the snake. Uh, so you see all these interesting names. And there's also um, the harp. And I think, I don't see, oh, here's the Christmas tree. There's something called a Christmas tree. Um, at, that, I mean, at the scale that we're looking at, it doesn't look like much of a Christmas tree, but uh, it might look better if, uh, if you were able to zoom in. Um, so here is um, the, a bubble around um, where the, uh, the mouse was. So this is the mouse, and this is the, um, the snake. And just to give you an idea of how long people have been studying the galactic center with radio waves, uh, the mouse was first described in a paper um, from 1987. And so this appears to be a very bright radio source that seems to have been ejected from this um, bubble. So this appears to be a supernova explosion um, that um, blew up and um, the um, progenitor star exploded, but there might have been uh, maybe another um, object that was orbiting it, perhaps a pulsar. And so uh, the pulsar got ejected. And so um, that is what's causing the mouse. And then as far as what is causing the snake, um, I, um, I haven't um, really dug deeply into this, but at least in, in the discovery paper, which was from 1991, so uh, just over um, 30 years ago, uh, they, uh, they point out that you know, it, it is um, kind of a weird structure. It has these kinks in it. It's a very bright filamentary structure, but um, it doesn't seem to be um, associated with any uh, particular radio sources. Um, but I haven't um, really dug into the literature, so maybe there are more current ideas about what exactly the snake is. But um, this gives you an idea of how powerful a tool um, like radio telescopes are, because it turns out that if you were to look at this with a normal telescope, uh, that's sensitive to light that your eyes are sensitive to, visible light radiation, you wouldn't see any of this just because there's so much gas and dust that blocks our line of sight towards the galactic center. And so it's really with radio telescopes that you're able to uh, peer through that muck of the intervening gas and dust in our interstellar medium in our galaxy and, uh, and to see these structures. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, next jump to a, um, a, another structure in our galaxy that is actually much closer to home. So the Galactic Center is um, about um, 24,000 um, light years or tw um, 26,000 light years away. Um, and, and, and this one, this is a stru uh, structure that actually surrounds our sun in our local sol solar neighborhood. And so um, to do that, I'm going to um, turn to this animation that I created using our Uniview uh, software. And we're gonna fly in uh, towards our Milky Way. So you can see the spiral galaxy over Milky Way. And we're flying toward the structure called the local bubble. And that's the blue blob that's floating ahead of you. And uh, this um, structure um, was, um, uh, this, 
the topic of a paper that I'm going to talk about next. And the, um, the authors of the paper um, released um, the 3D model, the information containing, um, that contains 3D information about this bubble. And um, our, our friends and colleagues at the California Academy of Sciences took that model and um, created um, a 3D model that could be loaded into our planetary software. And so that's um, flying into the local bubble. And uh, this local bubble um, it, it has actually um, been known about for quite a bit, but it, it appears to be, um, and people have suspected that it's uh, basically um, the result of multiple supernova explosions that have blown up uh, this bubble. And so there's relatively hot um, plasma in this bubble. And the bubble has also pushed out gas in different directions and, and kind of pushed and compressed the, um, the molecular gas that's uh, in the solar neighborhood. And so here is a YouTube video that shows this process. And so um, the uh, Catherine Zucker and the other authors of, um, of this paper that just came out think that um, supernova started going off about 14 million years ago. And so you can see the supernova uh, pushing out uh, the, the bubble, making it expand. And, um, and then about 5 million years ago, the sun, so we're repeating the animation, but they're showing the sun coming in. So that, um, our sun in its orbit around the galaxy uh, happens to uh, take it through the, the, um, the bubble. So the sun entered the bubble about 5 million years ago. And we happen to be um, roughly right in the middle of the bubble. Now, like a lot of uh, things in astronomy, uh, people have um, known about or suspected that um, our sun is in this local bubble for many years. So Steve Snowden and his um, <coughs> PhD thesis, he was um, observing in soft x-rays using a, um, a, an x-ray satellite. And he noted that there was x-ray gas in all directions, but um, the, the gas wasn't um, uniform so that um, in some directions like towards the North and um, South Galactic Poles, um, the bubble seemed to be more extended, whereas um, the bubble wasn't as, uh, um, as, as big or wide near the um, galactic plane or, or the galactic equator. So these are just different cutaways, um, different angles of that bubble from his thesis. And, um, and then the other interesting thing is that um, people have noted the fact that um, if you look at locations where there's star formation in the sky, so the, that those yellow blobs are uh, where the Taurus molecular clouds are, so they're just above um, Taurus the bull, um, constellation Taurus the bull. And in this animation, we're going to pull away from the sun and we're going to see a bunch of other molecular clouds. Uh, for those of you who um, know Sagittarius, that's Sagittarius. Um, so that's where the galactic center is. We're going to pull away and we're going to see um, the constellation lines distort because um, those are all in 3D. And now we're going to see the local bubble again and it's bubbly blue glory. And I'm going to turn up the constellation lines. And the note that those molecular clouds where um, stars are forming um, in, in the last several million years, they seem to be right at the edge of the bubble. And so even though people have speculated that the bubble might have pushed um, gas out um, towards um, outwards and compressed the gas, um, and during that compression, the um, parts of the gas cloud would have collapsed to initiate star formation, this is really the first time that we've had really good evidence um, where the locations of the stars um, have correlated really well, or at least of, of these young stars with these clouds with um, the edges of the local bubble. And then in this paper, um, they also show, um, they're able to show the, um, the velocities and the vectors or the motions of the stars in, um, in the um, from those young clusters. And so this is an animation of, um, and it's going to loop again. So it's showing the expansion of the bubble. Um, the line that's coming from the lower right, or lower left, is the, uh, the sun um, orbiting the galaxy. So the sun on um, its current position is right now, but um, we're going to see it again as it loops. And then the, um, the, the other lines um, show the motion vectors of those young stars that are associated with 
the um, with those young um, gas clouds, the, the, those young star clusters associated with those gas clouds that have been pushed outwards uh, from the supernova explosions that have caused the bubble. And I'm gonna, let's see, I'm just gonna pause this. And um, what you see is that those, um, all those uh, vectors, all those arrows seem to be perpendicular to the, um, to the surface of the bubble. And um, the Catherine Zucker, uh, the lead author of this paper actually has a website that you can go to and you can actually ex explore this 3D um, structure and, um, on your web browser and you can uh, rotate it and see it uh, from different directions. And you can actually see for yourself that all these arrows um, of these stars, um, they are actually perpendicular to the surface of the bubble. So that again suggests that um, the, the clouds that these stars originated from are being pushed out from the, um, from the local um, bubble expansion. And, um, and the paper also even cites specific um, star um, forming regions um, that uh, were, um, that um, got their start um, at various times over the last 10 million years or so. Um, but um, so um, here again is um, kind of a summary of those um, different groups. So uh, both, um, we talked about the Taurus um, clouds earlier, but uh, there are also clouds in Centaurus and Lupus and um, Chameleon and, um, and a couple of other places um, where um, the star formation in those clouds are again associated with the action of this bubble. And then um, again, just to summarize, um, this is a cartoon that I've shown in past 60 Minutes in Space uh, presentations, but um, the idea here is that um, if you have massive stars, uh, those stars can, uh, through their UV radiation and, and, and then also subsequently their um, supernova explosions, um, the, the energy from those explosions and from those massive stars can push against um, molecular clouds. And so you see um, kind of clouds being uh, compressed um, towards the left and towards the right. And, you, um, and when those clouds get compressed, and collapse, they uh, can have new star formation taking place. And so this is um, not a new idea. Um, people have um, thought about, um, and have speculated that this might be the case for many decades, but um, here is a work that um, really shows strong evidence uh, through lots of different lines of evidence that this indeed is happening and it's, in, and it's happening all around us. Um, this um, local bubble um, is about a thousand light years across and our sun um, just happens to uh, be right in the center of it, as I said. All right, so with that, I'm gonna, going to um, um, go to my last story and we're gonna um, come all the way um, back home and talk about the James Webb Space Telescope since that has been in the news for the last couple months um, since its launch um, in, uh, on Christmas uh, day of last year. And, um, and I know um, we haven't really um, talked about um, James Webb um, just because, um, well, I haven't, um, just because I really wanted to wait um, for the launch and to, um, to start seeing a lot of the kind of the interesting engineering results um, coming out of it before really talking about it. And, um, and right now there ha haven't actually been any science results that have come out from James Webb because it will be many more weeks before they have everything aligned. But what I want to do is at least talk about um, what the status of James Webb is today and, um, and to help you understand um, how James Webb has gotten to the point it is um, today. So first of all, um, James Webb, um, the James Webb G um, Space Telescope, or GWST, is often known as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And so one of the reasons why is that it's a much larger telescope. So here's a comparison of the two primary mirrors, one of Hubble and the other of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope mirror is about two and a half meters um, in diameter. So you can see a person for scale. Um, the James Webb is much larger, um, about, um, almost three times larger. It's about six and a half meters in diameter. But what's really important for telescopes is not only um, just the diameter, the larger the diameter of a mirror, the more detail that you can see um, when you're observing. But uh, also especially important is the collecting area. 
So the more collecting area that you have, the, uh, the more um, sensitive you are, uh, meaning you can actually collect more light from very faint objects. And so um, that means even if you had the same instrument on both the Hubble and both um, and James Webb, um, the Hubble Space Telescope would take far longer to expose to the same level of sensitivity than James Webb would, just because James Webb is collecting more photons coming from that object in deep space. And in this case, uh, James Webb has about six more, uh, just over six times the collecting area of the Hubble Space Telescope. And then here is a comparison of the size of the two um, telescopes. And um, you might think, and, um, well, you know, they don't look um, that much different in size, but um, James Webb does have um, the giant sun shield. Um, so that's the um, large um, platform like thing that um, is hanging off the bottom of the telescope in this animation. And um, so even though um, the Hubble Space Telescope um, was launched with the space shuttle, um, so um, it folds up and is you know, roughly about the size of a school bus. Um, but when it unfolds, it's not um, that much bigger than um, what it was um, when it was uh, launched. But um, James Webb is far, far larger. And here is a uh, mock-up of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Um, here's a picture that was taken at the Goddard Space Flight Center um, with um, all the uh, staff that were um, involved um, with James Webb. And uh, you can see uh, just enorm how enormous it is um, when you have a crowd of people underneath it. And oftentimes the comparison that I see made is that um, once uh, the James Webb um, is unfolded, it's uh, roughly about the size of a tennis court. And so here is a comparison of how big uh, James Webb is compared to a tennis court. And so you can see that the sun shield is actually slightly wider than a tennis court, but um, the, the length of the telescope would definitely fit in, um, inside um, your standard um, tennis court. So the reason why James Webb um, is important is that it's um, not only larger, but it also um, is, its instrumentation is in the infrared. So the Hubble Space Telescope observes primarily in the visible uh, portion of the spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the light radiation that our eyes are sensitive to, um, the, the light that makes up the rainbow. Um, but uh, the Hubble Space Telescope um, the, did have instruments that observed um, into the ultraviolet, so uh, beyond the blue and the violet. And then uh, it also had some instruments that um, observe um, slightly into the um, infrared, into what we call the near infrared. But the James Webb Space Telescope observes entirely in the infrared and not just the near infrared on the portion of the infrared spectrum, which is that's just on the other side of the red, but um, into what we call the mid infrared. So um, um, wavelengths that are um, 10 times longer than the near infrared. And um, the reason why the infrared is important is that it allows you to see structures uh, that you can't normally see or things that you can't normally see um, in visible light. Um, so I mentioned this when we were talking about the Galactic Center. If you were to look at the Galactic Center, um, all um, of the features that we saw wouldn't be visible, even if they were glowing in visible light, uh, because there's so much gas and dust in our line of sight. And here is um, an object in the Carina Nebula that's viewed by the Hubble Space Telescope on the left is in visible light, and on the right is in the near infrared. And if you look closely, you can see that there are um, the, the stars that are visible are in the left-hand image. You can see their um, counterparts, the same stars in the infrared image, but the infrared image has many, many more times uh, the number of stars. And that's just because there's so much gas and dust occluding or blocking the light from background stars uh, that they're hidden um, in the left image. But um, the inf in infrared light, um, those um, the stars um, just shine right through uh, much of the, the gas and dust. Um, although there are still some uh, really um, dense um, gas regions and you can sort of um, get a, a sense that uh, there's some um, uh, nodules of gas that are still uh, very dense and still very dark. Um, and so they might 
um, still high um, stars. So, so one reason is that um, you can peer through um, gas and dust, and this can be very useful when you're uh, exploring um, star forming regions, uh, regions that are, are often polluted with um, lots of gas clouds and um, interstellar dust. Another reason is if you want to look at the very distant universe. And so if you're looking at a galaxy and a galaxy, and as we know, the universe is expanding. And so uh, very distant galaxies, um, their light that we're seeing um, was emitted um, long ago in the past. And over time, as that light um, travels to us, um, that the wavelength of, the, of that light actually gets stretched by the expansion of the universe. And so a galaxy that's close by, uh, you might be seeing that light as blue, but um, that, if you move that galaxy to the other end of the universe, um, that light might become what we call redshifted, meaning the wavelength of that light has gotten lengthened. So going from uh, blue to, to red, and in some very extreme cases, you can even have ultraviolet light be redshifted into the red and even into the infrared. And so if you're interested in exploring um, towards the um, very beginning of the universe, meaning looking uh, very far away, but that also means you're probing objects that came into existence um, um, hundreds of millions, if not billions of years ago, and that light has taken uh, many hundreds of millions or many billions of years to travel to us, um, you uh, need to take into account of the fact that that light will get redshifted. And so the James Webb Space Telescope is actually, um, was designed originally to um, really help um, look for the very first stars. And so this um, uh, diagram shows you how far Hubble can see um, using some of its deepest fields. So when Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope um, images or aims at a particular portion of the sky for um, hundreds of orbits, it's able to see um, you know, so, uh, uh, roughly about um, a billion years um, after the Big Bang. But um, the goal of the James Webb Space Telescope is to um, go um, up to um, a couple hundred, um, up to about 300 million years after the uh, Big Bang. And that's when the very first stars um, lit up in the universe. And so um, the, the power of the James Webb will be to, um, to, to really probe the, uh, the very early conditions that led to the first stars and that led to the first galaxies in our universe. So, uh, but of course that's all in, um, still in the future. Um, but uh, let's uh, just go back and look at the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope first. And this launch uh, was done by the European St Space Agency and it took place in French Guiana, which is where ESA, the European Space Agency, has their, um, their launch, um, kind of their equivalent of um, Cape Canaveral um, in Florida uh, from the US. So let's take a look and listen. And we have zoom start. And lift off. Decollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. Vehicle performance is nominal. The Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. The rumble of a powerful Ariane 5 now being felt here in the control center. 3D animation. Okay, Rob, so far so good. Everything is nominal as uh, we say when altitude and trajectory of the iron pipe is going perfectly well, as you can see also on the video, on the screen, we had the confirmation of the uh, separation of the two filters, just 
and now of the ferry, meaning that we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. So everything is going to so be good. Extension of the Operation EPC. Séparation Web Space Telescope. Go Web! We do have confirmation of observatory separation. The James Webb Space Telescope amidst applause here in the Mission Control Center, now taking its first steps in pursuit of cosmological discovery. Quince events are running in good fashion according to the telescope controllers. And there is the view uh, from the upper stage camera on the Ariane 5 looking at the James Webb Space Telescope as it moves uh, gently away from its launch vehicle. Go away, go away. Yes, go away. Ironically enough, as we marvel on uh, this view from the upper stage camera, this will be humanity's last view of the James Webb te Space Telescope as it moves to its work place about a million miles away from Earth. Yes, all right, bro. All right, so uh, as many of you um, have probably heard, um, the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope didn't, doesn't end there, um, or didn't end there, uh, because um, what happened after it was it separated from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket um, is a very complicated series of maneuvers. And um, as the announcer um, said, you know, this is the last um, actual video um, recording evidence of, you know, of, of seeing um, GWST for, with our own eyes and everything else that um, we'll be seeing um, is based on uh, basically computer animations and simulations. But here is a simulation or an animation of what the um, deployment actually involves. And so um, in the um, first minutes after it's launched, 31 minutes, you have the, um, the solar array um, being deployed. So that's that kind of the pink thing that um, comes out. And then there's also a um, high gain antenna um, at the bottom. Um, and that antenna actually um, allows um, JWST to talk to the Earth. So it's always aimed at the Earth. And then there's also, um, or it deploys the, um, the sun shields. And then here it's pushing the tower assembly, um, which uh, pushes the telescope further away from the sun shield. The sun shield basically blocks um, the, the heat of the sun from the telescope. And uh, now we're seeing the deployment of the, uh, the mid um, boom arms. Um, and those basically pull out um, the sun shield uh, fabric. There's actually, I think six different um, or five different layers of fabric. And all these have different motors um, that are activated um, from the ground to deploy and then once they're pulled out, um, they're tensioned, and you're, um, um, dozens, not hundreds of motors to do the tensioning. Um, and then the, um, the secondary mirror gets deployed. And then there's another um, um, an aft radiator, radiator. And then the, um, the, the wings of the mirror get deployed. And this complicated sequence um, was needed uh, because the James Webb Space Telescope is so big, as you saw. Um, it's just too big to be launched, um, already deployed. And so the, the engineers had to come up with a system where they could uh, basically um, fold the telescope up and then have it unfold almost origami-like to its um, deployed state. So you can imagine um, an more enormous amount of effort and time was spent figuring out exactly how to do it and, and how to make it um, work. And, and so far, it's worked amazingly well. Now, another aspect of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope that you might have heard about is the idea that 
it orbits um, at a point called the um, L2 or the um, Lagrange point. And, um, and you've, um, many of you who have paid attention to the news, you might have seen um, this particular diagram where they talk about um, not only the L2, but there are actually uh, five different Lagrange points or Lagrangian uh, points. And these all um, co correspond um, to um, um, positions um, in space where um, orbiting bodies um, can be stable. And I want to spend uh, just a few minutes talk, talking about exactly what um, that is, what is meant by these Lagrange points. And basically, um, you have to go all the way back to Isaac Newton, because Newton was um, the person who first formulated um, or um, understanding of, of physics, um, of mechanics, and the laws of gravity and their forces. Uh, and Newton showed that you can um, exactly describe um, a two, two orbiting bodies. Um, whose only uh, forces acting on each other are gravity. And you can describe that um, completely and you can write a simple equation. But as soon as you um, try to um, describe a, a third body that's interacting gravitationally, it becomes impossible to describe completely. You basically have to use, you know, today we can use modern computers to, uh, to show how um, those orbits can evolve. But in the past, it was much more difficult. And so mathematicians, um, like Euler and Lagrange came up with descriptions of um, what they um, described as stable points, um, where um, orbiting uh, bodies that are um, in orbit ar um, around um, the sun and the earth, in some sense, and being influenced by the gravity of the sun and the earth. And, um, and it turns out that there, there can be a number of these um, stable, so-called stable Lagrange points. And the, the way to think about it First, we have to think of um, gravity as not a force, but as um, sort of like a potential. Um, and so one idea that's often used is to think of um, a massive body as being a weight in a, a sheet. And so you can imagine there's a big weight at the bottom here. And if you drop marbles and those marbles, um, their trajectories, they'll actually orbit around that weight, uh, that central body, uh, based on how much that sheet has been stretched. Um, by that central object. And, um, and so this is something that um, is used to uh, describe um, how gravity works in general relativity, but it also turns out to be a really useful analogy to think of um, when describing Lagrange points. And so here we have um, a simulation of the sun and the earth. Um, and um, on the bottom is kind of a grid representing the gravitational potential or um, the gravitational um, force coming from each body. So you expect the sun to have, uh, because it's uh, the most massive body in our solar system, it would have a large potential. And so you can imagine if you stuck a marble on that surface, it would row toward, uh, towards the sun and fall in, into the sun. The earth has a similar potential, but uh, because the earth is much smaller, you would expect um, the uh, distortion of that potential field to be smaller as well. So again, you, know, you would expect a marble to roll in towards the Earth, but um, it might not accelerate um, as quickly um, as towards the Sun, um, just because the Earth is a much smaller uh, body. Now, there's another uh, force that we have to deal with um, when we think when we add a third body to this, because um, when we're um, talking about Lagrange points, we're talking uh, about following this object in orbit around um, the Sun and, and, and the Earth. And when things are in orbit or when things are um, moving in um, a revolution around something else, um, another force actually becomes important. And, um, and this is the centrifugal force. And here is an example of that um, at an amusement park. As you can see, if you um, if the ride spins faster, there's um, the riders feel a centrifugal force that pushes them outwards, away from the center. And so you can imagine if you were following uh, this third object, like the JWST around in its orbit, um, it would also feel a centrifugal force. But unlike um, the previous. Um, uh, versions of the potential field where we saw divots or dips in, in that field, in that grid, 
Um, if you imagine um, a force kind of pushing outwards, well, then you would imagine the surface curving down away. And so if you dropped a marble, that marble would roll away from the center of this picture because you can imagine um, the, the, uh, that central fecal uh, force pushing away from the center. So if we added the, uh, the, the potential from the sun, added the potential from the earth, and then we added the potential from the centrifugal force that pushed outwards instead of uh, pulling inwards. And you, if you added all of them together, you would get this structure where you have uh, dimples or those divots caused by the gravity of the um, two main objects, the two bodies. But then the centrifugal force adds, um, instead of having a flat um, surface, it um, curves the surface so that um, your marble um, depending on where it is and how fast it's moving, it might want to escape from the system instead of uh, being um, led to orbit in it. And so here is what the um, that 3D uh, potential looks like. And the Lagrange points basically correspond to places where um, there are um, sort of saddle points or where there are points where it's relatively flat. So the L1, the uh, Lagrange point, is half um, is not halfway, but it's between the Earth and the Sun, and so you can imagine that um, it's um, it can be somewhat unstable because if the uh, if your object was uh, pushed um, slightly closer to the Sun or slightly closer to the Earth, it would end up orbiting um, closer to the Sun or closer to, to the Earth, um, um, and, and not stay in that L1 uh, point. L2 is um, just on the outside. So away um, from, from the Earth. And, and this is where uh, James Webb, as well as other um, telescopes that we put up there are. And again, you can see it's, um, it's sort of quasi-stable, meaning if you stay close to that L2 point, um, it, it won't wander off. But if you push it a little bit further away, um, its orbit will uh, continue um, getting larger and larger because there's a roll off there. And if you push it closer in, um, it will um, move closer to the Earth. There's also um, another point on the opposite side of the Earth and Sun that's um, also quasi-stable. And then there are also these L4 and L5 points, and uh, these are known as the, uh, the Trojan points, and that's just because um, in the, um, in the a scenario where you're looking at Jupiter and the Sun, it turns out that there are a bunch of asteroids that orbit um, in, um, in the same orbit as Jupiter, but um, 60 degrees away from it. And, and there are these L4 and L5 points. And so here is um, all five of those points. Um, and then here is an animation showing um, how um, you, know, you can imagine um, orbiting um, with um, the Earth um, in the L2 point um, and, and seeing um, how that would look from an observer that's standing um, outside. And then as far as what James Webb would look like, here is an animation of James Webb in its L2 orbit. And instead of just um, being at L2, um, what they've done is they've placed it in what's known as the halo orbit. And that's um, that additional circle or ellipse that um, the JWST um, orbits around. And it turns out that um, this um, makes it um, be a little bit stabler than it was exactly at, at L2 because um, it turns out that um, you're going up and um, slightly up the potential hill and then um, coming back down it and that um, leads to um, some stability there. Um, but that, uh, that halo orbit, that additional little circle that it goes around is actually really enormous. So it's, um, it's, it's actually larger than the orbit of the moon around the Earth. Um, so um, the, the James Webb Space Telescope isn't um, in Earth's shadow um, because you can see how big that orbit is. And in fact, it needs um, to be able to um, have the sun visible um, in order to get power for its solar panels. But um, it is always in view of the Earth. So uh, that means the, uh, that high gain antenna can always be pointed at the Earth. And, um, and the sun shield basically provides the thermal insulation that keeps the, um, the cold side cold and the hot side hot. And so um, the, um, the cold side um, is, uh, is where um, James Webb is actually observing. So it's, it can't see 
um, the entire sky, um, but it only sees a fraction of the sky. So over the course of uh, six months or a year, you can have complete coverage of the sky. All right, um, I'm gonna um, just spend a few uh, minutes talking about um, just the, um, how the, the mirrors are set up. And it turns out that um, if you, um, that telescope mirrors are um, very carefully designed. So if you um, make a mirror um, that's spherical, um, light rays that come in won't all, all get focused exactly to the same spot. And, and you have something called spherical aberration. Uh, but if you make a mirror that's parabolic, then you can uh, get something that's um, um, completely focused. Uh, but um, you know, when you're dealing with big mirrors and you're grinding them to be very exact, sometimes errors can come in. And so you have to be really sure that your mirror is shaped correctly. And this is a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope where um, that you did suffer from spherical aberration. And so here is um, on the image on the left is um, when um, Hubble was initially launched more than 30 years ago, and there was a mistake in, how, uh, in the shape of the mirror. And so um, the light rays didn't come to a point. And you can see how an image of the star looks a little fuzzy. You have all these um, extra light that's coming off of it. But um, after it was fixed, um, all the light um, got concentrated um, towards the center. And um, they, um, this is also something that they have to worry uh, about for James Webb. Um, but um, James Webb is made up of not just one mirror, but 18 mirror segments. And so here is how big each of these mirror segments are. Um, they're made up of um, beryllium, a metal which has um, really good properties as far as expansion and how you know, um, hard it is um, and stable it is in the depths of space. Um, they, um, here um, is that mirror um, after, um, in the clean room. And then the mirror itself has a number of um, actuators, seven actuators that actually push on it. There's little tiny pistons and those pistons help the mirror uh, become alive. And if here is someone to talk about that. You picked a star that was very bright and didn't have any stars near it that would contaminate the image. We know that the primary mirror segments aren't aligned. So they actually act like 18 separate telescopes. And we expect to see 18 separate images, one for each mirror, that are a little bit blurry at this point because we haven't aligned or focused them. And so we pointed at a bright star and we made a mosaic. We actually took the near infrared camera and we took images in different parts of the sky. And then we looked for the 18 spots from the 18 different telescopes, if you will. And we were very excited to find them. And the 18 spots were actually fairly close to each other. So really everything was very close to what was predicted. We've identified which of the 18 spots is which mirror. At this point, we even know which ones are from the wings. And uh, it turns out one of the wings, you can actually see those three spots are a little farther over. Um, and, and that's sort of what we expected. Um, so we've identified all 18 spots. And uh, the next step is to make an array of them. And then we're ready to start uh, what we call global alignment, which is when each of those 18 spots will start to be aligned and focused. And that's sort of the, the last step before we take those 18 spots and put them on top of each other to start forming a single star going through the 18 separate telescopes. And that's the work that we'll be starting to see. We also took a, a selfie of the primary mirror. We took an image of the primary mirror, and that helps us understand the alignment of the telescope, especially the primary mirror, to the the camera itself and the instruments. There's actually a special lens in the near infrared camera. And it allows you to take a complete picture of the primary mirror itself. And in this particular case, one of the segments is pointing at a star. So that is the segment that lights up. But you can see the outline through the shadows of all 18 segments. And you also can see the outline of what's inside of the instrument itself. And you can see how well that primary mirror in the telescope is aligned to the instrument. And that gives us some initial confidence that the alignment looks good, and that's a good starting point for doing the alignment process. All right, so as you can see, there's still um, quite a lot of uh, work uh, that uh, still needs to be done before we get on the first science images back. But um, the, um, the video gives you a really good idea of what they're um, trying to do. And so uh, th these are just. Um, some, you know, the basic idea is that we, instead of one telescope mirror, we basically have 18 separate mirrors that are all slightly tilted um, towards different parts of the sky. I mean, they're pointed roughly in the right direction, but they have to be aligned 
say, um, to create a single uh, telescope mirror. And so these are simulated um, images of what that alignment process is like, um, going from um, you know, mirrors that aren't quite focusing the stars uh, to all the mirrors focusing the stars. And then um, as you saw in the video, uh, they've identified um, and, and uh, moved into place um, all of the mirrors so that um, the images are at least in the right places. And then over time, what they'll do is they'll start um, shifting um, groups of mirror segments, you know, the, the A mirrors, and then the B mirrors, and then the C mirrors until the star images all completely align. And then it turns out that there's a number of other steps that they do um, to really get the alignment um, down to the nanometer um, level of precision. And, um, and they, um, they actually use some of the telescope instruments um, to, um, to make, um, help make measurements. And basically the idea is that, um, you know, the analogy that I heard was that if, you, if the JWST mirror was the size of the United States, then each of the segment mirrors would be maybe the, the size of Texas. And in the end, once everything is aligned, then uh, they should be all within about an inch, an inch and a half of, 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 of error uh, next to each other. And that's kind of the level of um, accuracy of level uh, that they want uh, for these uh, mirrors. And so, um, and then, um, you know, even after they finished with um, this particular um, camera, um, they also have to align um, the rest of the instruments um, over um, all the fields of view uh, for this telescope. So there are still uh, many weeks um, left of um, work um, with um, James Webb before they can have the first science images. But um, when that happens, um, I'll be sure to report that in a future 60 minutes um, in space. So I think we're um, definitely running um, short on time, but um, Mitch, I'm happy to answer questions. And I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. All right, yeah. And for those of you who uh, only had an hour for this and need to go, we totally understand. But if you'd like to stick around, we have some time to, uh, for some questions. And if you haven't already, put your questions in the chat. Um, so right away, what's the life expectancy of the James Webb Space Telescope? Um, I actually don't know what the official um, life expectancy is. Um, there, there is, um, yeah, so, so I, I would have to look that up. But, you know, um, the, the problem with um, space telescopes in the infrared is that um, the further you go into the infrared, the more you have to cool the telescope. Um, and that's just because anything that's warm um, is emitting um, heat energy, uh, the same uh, wavelengths that um, you're trying to detect from objects um, distance uh, that are very distant in space. And so um, it's like, you know, trying to um, take a picture of something and someone's sh shining a flashlight in your eyes or um, into your camera. Um, imagine, you know, every part of you, including your camera, also emitting light that would um, obviously ruin uh, the pictures that you're trying to take. And so um, infrared telescopes um, usually have coolers um, or in the past, um, they had reservoirs of liquid helium that would cool the instruments to the um, temperatures, you know, that are um, maybe um, a few degrees, 10 degrees above absolute zero. That's necessary for those instruments to be able to do their science. Um, what's new about James Webb is that um, instead of having just a big helium um, tank that um, slowly boils off. So in past infrared telescopes, that helium would um, literally escape over time um, as it because it would basically be used up to cool off, cool off the telescope instruments. But um, the, the way I understand it, James Webb actually has the closed cycle of helium um, refrigerator. So it um, has electronics uh, to um, help keep, um, to, to recool the helium and to reuse that um, liquid helium. Um, so I don't actually know what the um, expected um, lifetime is because part of it, um, I would have to look that up. It um, has to do with how efficient uh, the helium refrigerator is and what um, the expected losses of the helium over time are. Uh, but I expect that even if um, it does lose all of its helium, it uh, probably can still, um, you know, do, uh, you might not be able to do as sensitive observations in the further or in the mid infrared but it still might be able to do observations in the near infrared. Very cool. 
And uh, so you mentioned a few things, like some of the oldest stars in the universe. What else might James Webb be able to see? Is it going to find dark matter? Um, well, dark matter, by definition, doesn't emit any light or uh, electromagnetic radiation. And so um, James Webb wouldn't be able to directly uh, observe dark matter. Uh, but um, you know, uh, because um, it's observing in the infrared, it's actually really useful for observing um, young um, and, and distant planetary systems. And so um, with its sensitivity, it's thought that um, James Webb um, would be able to um, sample atmospheres of um, extrasolar planets, so planets around other stars. So this is something that Hubble can already do where, um, and um, you know, planets are very, very difficult um, to observe just because they're so small compared to their parent star. Um, the starlight is so much, um, you know, it's like a billion times brighter than um, the light that's coming off of the planet. But there are tricks that um, people have come up with to observe the, uh, the atmospheres of planets. Um, and so what they do is they'll observe um, a star um, when the planet is in front of the star. And so a planet is really small. I mean, um, and so it's much smaller than the star, but um, you'll still see the signature of starlight that's gone through the atmosphere of that planet. And so you compare that light with light when the planet is on the other side of the star. And so you're only seeing the starlight. And if you do a very careful subtraction of the light from those two different um, scenarios, you will actually get um, the light that's only coming uh, from the, um, that's the result of the planet's atmosphere. And so the Hubble Space Telescope has been used to do this sort of experiment. And um, we think that James Webb would be able to do it much, much uh, better um, because it's so much more sensitive. And so uh, being able to um, really um, sample and understand uh, the atmosphere, um, getting uh, understand the chemistry of planetary atmospheres, and even uh, you know potentially um, figuring out if there's life because uh, there are certain biosignatures that we can observe in atmospheres, or what we think we can observe, depending on what kind of life is out there. So uh, there might be a chance that you know we might detect um, evidence for life. Cool. <laughs> Finally, right. <laughs> Um, so Tegan H10 is wondering, how far out can James Webb see? Well, the, um, I mean, uh, it's not just uh, how much for how far out, but how uh, far back in time. So the universe is 13.7 billion years old. And so the, um, that means uh, the furthest that light can possibly travel to get to us is 13.7 billion years. And it turns out that um, there there are uh, actual, um, not physical, so much physical, but uh, barriers based on physics uh, that prevents us from looking further back than about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, so there are other telescopes that um, can observe radiation coming from about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, but, um, but those are in the microwaves and, and they're detecting uh, much more um, nebulous um, features, whereas James Webb, should be able to detect um, the earliest um, stars and the earliest galaxies that might have um, shown up perhaps a few hundred, you know, as early as 300 million years after the Big Bang. So that's, you know, about 13 and a half billion um, years in the past. And, um, and if, if you think about it, you know, the light took 13 and a half billion years to travel to us because the universe is expanding where that object is today is actually much, much further away um, than 13 and a half billion light years away. So um, it's actually you know, on the order of um, maybe two and a half or, um, times even further away or three times further away than that. If you were to you know, point out where that object, where that distant galaxy is today. Wow, so far <laughs> and both through time and space. Um, so does debris collect around Earth's Lagrange points like it does around Jupiter's? And does that cause a problem for the telescope? Uh, I, I think um, you, uh, you do hear about um, objects that, um, and actually, um, yeah, I, I, I unfortunately don't pay enough attention to that particular um, news, but um, theoretically, um, you can have debris um, collecting um, 
And, uh, but um, it's not so much of a worry because it, um, as you saw, um, that big halo orbit, um, that, you know, the, the telescope is making this big circle around that L2 point. So it's not just stuck in that L2 point, it's, um, its orbit causes it to circle it. And that additional, you know, circular orbit, that smaller orbit is um, on the order, it's actually slightly larger than the moon's orbit around the Earth. So there's actually quite a lot of space there. And there are multiple um, telescopes that are already out there. And so it's, um, you know, it, stuff might collect there, but, um, you know, in order for that stuff to be a danger to James Webb, it would have to be somehow um, had to have been inserted into a similar halo orbit. And that, you know, probably is somewhat unlikely. All right, smart. So how does J, uh, JWST maintain and adjust its altitude? Like, how does it aim what it wants to look at? Um, I, that's something that I haven't read explicitly about, but I'm, um, I'm guessing it's similar to what um, Hubble has, which are um, just reaction wheels. And so these are just um, big, heavy wheels that um, spin at high speed, like uh, basically giant gyroscopes. And, um, and Hubble um, it actually ha um, ha has had them fail um, over the years. And so um, some of the um, astronaut support missions to Hubble have been to replace um, those gyro um, wheels. And, um, and so I, I actually don't know um, how many um, of those that um, James Webb um, has. Um, but, um, you know, I guess that would um, definitely be one way to end the life of James Webb is if you had enough of them fail so that you couldn't point the telescope accurately anymore. All right, cool. Using, yeah, that's how you maneuver in microgravity. It's, <laughs> the wheels don't have to touch anything. Um, so going back to our local bubble, back at the beginning of your presentation, does the haze of that bubble have a significant impact on our telescopes? Uh, well, it turns out that there's so much uh, stuff out there that the local bubble um, you know, might have an impact, but it's pretty marginal. So the local bubble is, um, is filled with a very tenuous plasma, maybe a high temperature um, gas on the order, you know, maybe 10,000 degrees. Uh, Celsius, but it's very dilute. And so, um, you know, for the most part, uh, visible light isn't really affected by it. But um, there is, you know, if you think of the local bubble as also including the stuff that um, it's pushed out against. So the local bubble has swept up um, gas clouds that were inside the bubble and has pushed them out until they collected on kind of the, the edges of the local bubble. And some of those gas clouds are intense enough and large enough to have condensed and collapsed to form new clusters of stars. And so depending on which direction you're looking at, you might argue that you know, there are um, regions where the density of gas and dust is enhanced by the local bubble. But the fact of the matter is, you know, pretty much no matter which direction you look in our galaxy, and even if you look up um, out of the plane of the galaxy, there is substantial gas and dust. And so there's always going to be some um, dilution of the, uh, or scattering of light um, from, um, from stars that um, be, be before they get to your telescope. And so when astronomers try to um, ascertain, understand uh, the light coming from distant stars, they often do have to make um, corrections for the intervening gas and dust, especially if they're you know, trying to make really um, accurate um, Understand, um, calculations, understandings of you know what that light is telling us. So um, so there's just a lot of dunk out there, and the local bubble um, can probably add um, to it. But depending on what you're trying to look at and how far away you're looking, um, you're um, probably dealing with other stuff that's also in the way. All right, very cool. Um, so I just put in the in the chat the link to our next sixty minutes in space Wednesday March thirtieth special guest. Dr. Jessica Libby Roberts. Um, all right, we have a very important question. What are the designs on your shirt? <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> well, it's an old uh, Aloha shirt that my wife got for me in Hawaii when we were in Hawaii, and I think uh, there's surfboards. So. All right, all right, surfboards. I've read in comic books that you can travel through space on those if yeah, they're the yeah. right color. 
that's a silver surfer joke no one knows. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're uh, right down to the end of our program. Um, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Uh, I thought it was a great presentation. Had a great time. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Any final thoughts for us? Well, I uh, don't know what uh, Jessica will be covering um, next time, but um, um, if there's um, some new um, James Webb um, content, hopefully um, she'll be um, talking about that. But um, I think um, you know, with James Webb up there, and um, you know, one of the things that I, along with lots of other astronomers worried about was just how complicated that whole James Webb deployment um, was. You know, um, the number that you often heard about was there were more than 300 separate you know, possible points of failure during that deployment process. So that you know, one thing um, went wrong that could, um, you know, that could seriously impact the science of the mission. But so far um, from um, what I understand, everything has been going um, really smoothly. So, um, you know, um, each time we launch a big mission like this, it's built um, and based on uh, everything that we've learned in the past. And, um, you know, with this um, newest, biggest and um, telescope that we've put up so far, um, I think it's been a, a real testament to just the ingenuity um, and the perseverance of um, everyone that's been involved on that team, um, engineers as well as the scientists. Amazing. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone.